So, um, good evening, everybody. And we are um, joining back after a very short break. So, this is the ninth lecture of our webinar series. And today, we have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Anil K. Patnaik from Air Force Institute, uh, United States. And good morning, sir. And let me welcome the director uh, of International School of Photonics, Professor Pramod Gopinath, to formally chair the session and, of course, to introduce the speaker. Over to you, Pramod, sir, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Praveen. It's my uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Anil K. Patnaik, who is a friend of mine since 1997. Currently, he's an associate professor of physics at the Air Force Institute of Technology, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, USA. His specializations uh, include a wide range of topics in uh, ultra-fast laser matter interactions, quantum optics and information, and on a variety of optical sensing applications. He has worked extensively on these topics, leading to about 180 highly cited journal publications, books, chapters, conference presentations, invited talks, and seminars. Amongst other publications, he has authored two extensive reviews on optical sensing applications. One of them has earned a top 1% cited engineering journal paper status in the web of science. Dr. Patnaik, received his PhD in quantum optics under the guidance of Professor G.S. Agarwal, the then director of physical research laboratory in Ahmedabad. He held several academic and visiting positions at prestigious institutions, such as the Princeton University, Texas A&M, Purdue University, Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics, Garching, Germany. He was also a JSPS postdoctoral research associate at the University of Electrical Communications, Tokyo, Japan. Dr. Patnaik has the distinction of working with Nobel laureate Professor Roy J. Glober on fundamental laser matter interactions and co-authored a research article with him in a special issue commemorating the 100 years of Einstein's miraculous discoveries. He has recently received AFIT Dean's Distinguished Professor Award. Dr. Patnaik is a fellow of Optical Society of India. He has been actively involved in numerous professional societies such as the American Physical Society, the Optical Society of America, and the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And on a personal note, as I told earlier, he's a good friend of mine since 1997. We were together uh, doing an SCRC school on uh, nonlinear optics and laser spectroscopy at IIT Delhi, and also was associated when um, PRL organized or uh, conducted the National Laser Symposium in December 1997, when the small group of quantum electronics headed by Professor GSA was organizing that. And they had only something like three faculty members there, uh, including Director GSA, uh, then uh, Professor Banerjee and uh, Dr. N.G. Singh, and three to four research students, including Anil, Sunish, and a few postdoctoral associates. Right, right. With this note, uh, let me welcome Dr. Anil to give his talk. Welcome to you, Dr. Anil. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Gopinath. It, it's, uh, it's, it's really a privilege and uh, honor to be in this um, uh, celebration, uh, Golden Jubilee, sorry, Silver Jubilee celebration of uh, International School for Photonics. And uh, before I start, I, I cannot uh, thank enough uh, Professor Gopinath for this invitation. It's, uh, uh, we are connecting back scientifically again, uh, but personally, we knew each other for more than uh, two decades now, 24, 25 years now, like uh, he, he mentioned. And uh, um, uh, we are in uh, two different continents now, talking about uh, very similar science. And uh, it is, it is uh, really uh, an honor to be uh, in this uh, webinar series. Uh, it's it's amazing to see the series that that uh, you have put together and uh, um, i i hope that my talk is uh, helpful to uh, some of your colleagues and uh, students over there um, and also i talk i, I thank uh, dr pravin for the introduction too um, thank you for your kind words uh, professor gopinath let me get started um, so i'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of the uh, 
developments and uh, the research work that I did in last uh, decade or so um, about this ultra fast laser matter interaction um, for sensing and uh, also the fundamental physics uh, in, in this ultra fast laser matter interactions. Well, uh, I will start with the quote that uh, the knowledge is always important. But what Einstein said is like imagination is always more important than knowledge. Why? Because knowledge takes you only a certain level and imagination always pushes that knowledge level. And uh, let's see what are the uh, levels that we can push over here with uh, ultra fast laser matter interactions. Okay, before I get started, I also want to acknowledge my, all my colleagues uh, uh, in last decade or so. I mean, this is my uh, list of my um, collaborators and students and postdocs who primarily contributed to uh, what I'm going to present. Uh, this is a list from last almost one decade, uh, but specifically on laser matter interaction part. And um, the, uh, I also thank the funding agencies, of course, to continue any good research. So let me start uh, um, with with this discussion of why do we need ultra fast? What is the uh, even the requirement at all? Why we need to get to the femtosecond uh, regime or uh, attosecond regime? If you, if uh, whoever have uh, uh, done any research or was thinking of any research, this is this is a um, chart where I just want to. Um, bring your attention to the different time scales that, uh, that nature gives us. Okay, so, well, nature and of course, with our own uh, physics and uh, technology, where we have reached there. So, when we say a second, uh, typically our heartbeat is a second. But now, uh, the LED refresh rate, for example, when you have like... Uh, 60 hertz, 120 hertz LED TVs or monitors, those are like uh, millisecond. And then uh, the amplitude modulation radio, the radio that you hear is about microsecond uh, time period, I mean the, uh, the, the pulse uh, durations. Um, and then uh, the computer processor speed that of course keeps increasing, but it's in the order of nanosecond and uh, Within that time frame, also you can you can uh, also say the electronic relaxation, for example, in any molecule or even in atoms. Once you excite the electrons to one of the excited state, the relaxation time scale is in the order of uh, like microsecond to nanosecond. Vibrational relaxations are more towards microsecond, uh, uh, but it can go somewhere around nanosecond too. Rotational relaxations are relaxations are faster. They go somewhere between picosecond to nanosecond, yeah. And uh, uh, so, microsecond is a millionth of a second. I have to keep telling myself, in fact, it's a millionth of a second. Okay, our uh, eyes that can see only like 15 uh, hertz, 20 hertz, maybe. And if you are a gamer, maybe you can go 30 hertz. But uh, <laughs> uh, so you can see the the, the changes really fast. But typically, we, that's where we are limited. We are talking about millionth of a second here. And let's, let's look at a millionth of a millionth of a second. And that's where the molecular rotation is. That molecular rotation period is on the order of picosecond. That is millionth of a millionth of a second. And if you go millionth of a billionth of a second, that's where the molecular vibration is. Molecular vibrations go at, at the femtosecond level. Yeah. And if you go beyond, uh, well, first of all, let me pull uh, the femtochemistry uh, for the femtochemistry. Joel got the Nobel Prize because he could look at the molecular motions using this femtosecond spectroscopy. Uh, but if I want to go beyond, then at attosecond level, this is the electronic period going around the atom. And at this time scale, I want to imagine what this time scale is. Let's now for, for a minute uh, consider like electron going around the atom once. Let's consider for now that is like one second. Then in our one second, 
that electron would have gone through from the beginning of the universe to now that much time okay so it's a 10 to a minus 18 is a, a billionth of a billionth of a second and these are something that that uh, uh, for us it appears like well they are so tiny time scale how can that even affect anything right well um, the electrons uh, are the one that gives you ke any chemical interaction for example the molecular uh, motions and rotational uh, molecular rotations they give you this particular spectra the light that you see the uh, any interaction that happens those things happen at those scales time scales in fact yeah of course the the interaction real interactions elongate longer towards the like nanosecond to microsecond and so on but the the because those dynamics are there at those time scales we need to understand them uh, and uh, it shows up in our spectra in fact uh, if you if you do any of the spectroscopy well uh, in in the attosecond in fact uh, there are recent developments in the last one decade there is a significant development in terms of like even looking at electrons so what is the advantage of this uh, because uh, sorry femtosecond and attosecond uh, uh, lasers if you have uh, what is the advantage think about it something like in a dark room if you want to flash for certain time and then you take a picture the picture that you get on your photo plate is only for the time that that flash went in okay if my flash is femtosecond then i can see any change within the femtosecond time scale or if the flash is in attosecond i can see any change in the electronic time scale okay that means that probably i would be able to see if there is an ionization that is happening at attosecond time scale i can see the ionization and this is what was uh, proposed and uh, and they saw some uh, data i mean they have some information in terms of like how the ionization happens in uh, in a, in nitrogen uh, monens group magad monens group at colorado they have shown it uh, way back in 2008 there are a lot of developments after that in attosecond science but i just wanted to tell you that these are the different time scales okay now having said that now let me get to uh, the um, applications where do we need those okay so um, let me start with uh, th the spectroscopy and imaging so there are I mean these are mostly the in uh, the engineering applications that I'm talking about like small core engines where you want to get to higher and higher pressures uh, those are like harsh environment real harsh environment or there are so called detonation engines uh, those uh, in those cases things can go I mean the pressure can go to 200 bars how do you make even measurements in those things right rocket propulsion 300 bars and uh, if you do even go to the different uh, planet like Venus Venus has 90 bar over there it's a uh, really harsh uh, atmosphere there and uh, in those things if you want any measurement at all you have to be looking for new technologies because the standard uh, optical diagnostics and all they are not going to work so there, there are so many of these diagnostic challenges uh, uh, of course uh, the, most of the diagnostic challenge I have listed here is primarily from the combustion uh, in, in, because of the combustion process you will have suits there and then the, particularly going to high pressure would have this high optical depth any light that you want to send it through it won't go to go through completely uh, so so you cannot get any diagnostic signal there if you want to see something inside let's say uh, at, at uh, 300 bars uh, probably most of the light that is going in will get absorbed right so how do you get any signal from there then um, the collisional rates would increase the so signal decays very fast and uh, even the decay rates at those uh, uh, pressures and all these are not known there are even more complexities I have not listed all of them in fact supercritical states particularly in Venus and all there are supercritical states where uh, um, it, it is neither gas nor liquid somewhere in between so um, uh, we have done some of the I mean the group that uh, we work together 
uh, they have done some uh, femtosecond Kars measurement going up to 40 bar and uh, they have shown that uh, they can recover the um, signal information at least decay information in that case and um, so what what I'm trying to allude to is that there are these scenarios where the standard diagnostic techniques are not going to work and we should be looking for newer techniques and seems like um, in higher pressure uh, this femtosecond spectroscopy works I can I will talk a little bit about it why it works but let's see even say for example the dynamics uh, in kilohertz and megahertz rate if you if you want to make a measurement uh, you can see at a megahertz rate which means that um, at 10 microsecond level uh, if whatever changes are that uh, physical changes that are happening you can make a measurement there so in the rigs for example in the, these are all in the air force league the rigs the test rigs uh, the measurements are done where you can see in real time you can see what are the changes in the different species i think this is the water line and this is uh, this is the piv the velocity velocimetry measurement over there so uh, what we have seen is that femtosecond laser enables some kind of um, uh, gives a better measurement uh, uh, method at high pressures and uh, typically uh, one can one can say that at high pressures because the the time scales are like collisional time scales are sh um, becomes shorter and shorter um, femtosecond being short pulse you have the ability to go and get the signal before any collision that happens so we'll come into det uh, more details maybe at, a late, at the later part of the talk so before we go to any of the applications talk about any of the application i want to uh, point out that everything at the detail when you when you look for the signal and try to understand it that's where the physics comes in the physics of light matter interaction uh, th that is what we we need to uh, always be looking for so uh, interactions at this microscopic at, at, at the atomic or molecular level is the one that gives me the macroscopic signal that we see and the microscopic signal if i want to understand i have to understand the interactions at the microscopic level yeah so um this slide probably most of you know but there i i assume that some of the students may be new so i just want to start with uh, like you know absorption is like you bring in a laser and then your electron goes from one state to another state in an atom or it could be molecule too uh, i'll come to molecule in a bit um, and uh, then uh, how much light was absorbed if i see in my detector i can measure it that tells me some information about the the sample through which which it went or the target through which it went Similarly, emission, you excite the electron to one of the excited state and then when it de-excites, then uh, spontaneously it de-excites, that gives you a spontaneous emission signal or stimulated, uh, uh, you can stimulate it uh, and you'll get stimulated emission signal. Okay, now having said that, how this uh, absorption emission behave at, uh, at such high uh, I mean ultra short pulses with uh, with femtosecond lasers for example so um, we should be I mean if I want to optimize my interactions up uh, and uh, you know if I want to do any experiment uh, for in, uh, all of the experiment list you would say that the first thing I should be looking for is what is the maximum signal I can get right so I have to get to this optimal uh, level of uh, uh, I have to get to the optimal level of interactions. Um, I hope everything is going well. Can you guys see me and uh, can you hear? Can can somebody confirm? Yes, I yes, yes, I, yes, 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 absolutely all right. Okay, thank you. Um, so so to, to optimize the interaction, I should be looking for what is the saturation threshold, right? So uh, we looked for the saturation threshold. Once Once we know, then that would be important to... Um, determine the design parameters for the experiments for example right so let's say look let's look at the absorption simple two level absorption what would happen in two level absorption you'll get a Lorentzian there with a width yeah now uh, but if I keep increasing the intensity at some point what will happen is uh, 
my electrons are going i mean this is this is the two level atom these blue dots are electron let's say they are going back and forth and then on average let's say a few electron will go up and then come some of them will come down but then finally everything will 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 come to the ground state but if i keep increasing the intensity what will happen is that all these electrons will go back and forth and then you you will get so called lamp dip for for uh, uh, those who have worked with uh, cw laser or uh, long pulse lasers nanosecond lasers th then you will you can rec identify this as a um lamp dip is the one that you use typically for um uh, any references uh, references that you want to have in in uh, atomic and molecular systems uh, um but that's for the long pulse what happens for the short pulse for the short pulse for the for a 100 nano uh, for 100 femtosecond pulse when you keep increasing the intensity of the laser what happens is that the probe absorption uh, it goes i mean even when you are resonant there it goes from high absorption to at some point it starts to drop the absorption starts to drop and drops to almost like zero uh, at a much higher intensity well uh, why is it happening this is a theoretical plot by the way um, so so why it is happening and if you look at the population inversion in fact the population inversion goes up population inversion is how much population over here versus this okay the population inversion goes up and then starts oscillating as you go to higher and higher intensities okay so this is definitely a saturation of the two level system um with a femtosecond pulse but also um this is not a uh, your cw or long pulse saturation this is like a non equilibrium a dynamic saturation there yeah so let's understand that saturation little bit so in the in the cw of lasers uh, so you have this population inversion there uh, with the uh, with your you know probably all of you are aware of rabi frequency there is a rabi oscillation of population going back and forth that gives you the gives you this oscillation and uh, this is called the rabi period and uh, uh, your when when the rabi period is uh, shorter than your decay time scale this is my decay time scale let's say um uh whatever the decay time scale for the for any system that we are talking about for a generic system yeah and if that is the case then we say that saturation happens and the uh, the lamp dip that i was talking about that's what you are going to get for cw lasers whereas um the, so in the under damping regime you will get it what happens to the ultra fast saturation uh, ultra fast saturation can can it be done in the under under damping regime because look at this i mean if the same uh, rabi oscillation that that i had in the system with the same uh, let's say laser intensity uh, but my, my now my pulse duration is so short i have uh, like as if like uh, from cw i'm kind of uh, putting all the energies in a very short time so in in this case we are talking about femtosecond but with with that uh, with that pulse if that is shorter than even your um your uh, decay time scale can i get uh, saturation i don't and uh, even though um, my um, rabi period is shorter than the, your decay time scale you still don't get saturation there and you still don't get saturation means in principle you can keep increasing your laser intensity and you can still increase your you know signal that you're looking for and uh, that's a boon but we have to understand why and how it happens so now uh question is transition will never saturate should we should we be happy well we investigated here in this paper and what we found is the following yeah uh so uh, the ultra fast saturation criterion it it does saturate yeah because uh, we saw it, the plot the plot that i saw uh, showed earlier uh and why it saturates now is because now if you keep increasing the intensity at some point what will happen is this one will go i mean the rabi oscillation is uh uh is higher than um, or or there are couple of rabi oscillations within your pulse and that's when you will see the saturation 
so it's, it's definitely the ravi oscillation has to be um, uh, sorry ravi frequency has to be larger than uh, the ravi frequency for the cw um, and that's where you get can get saturation in fact to to look at any of those saturation phenomena or processes the best way to uh, make uh, any uh, theoretical prediction was to look for area under the curve uh, so if i assume a gaussian uh, input pulse uh, that is going through this medium then the, the the in the limit that time goes to infinity the pulse area if it satisfies this condition where t is a um, uh to tau is the duration of the pulse yeah omega is the ravi frequency then this is the condition that that uh, at which you will uh, oh sorry if if this this uh, area under the curve is larger than uh, pi over 2 that's where you will get the saturation and from there you can obtain a saturation criterion in fact this is a saturation criterion we have observed, obtained and you can see it is dependent on the duration of the pulse and it is duration of, uh, dependent on the dipole moment of the uh, of the medium so um, if i step back and try to understand what it means is that if think about um, like you have a forced oscillator you are forcing the os- uh, i mean like like a swing let's say you are hitting it but you are hitting at it at a frequency uh, much faster than uh, the the swing's oscillation frequency right so at that time it will just it cannot just take it anymore and that's why that's where you will call that it is a saturation phenomenon now so this, this, it's slightly different but uh, they they are um, uh, uh, i mean that's how you get the saturation over here okay now let me go to the molecular states now in the molecular states are slightly more complex than the atomic states because you have this um, electronic states there So this is ground electronic state this is excited electronic state and then you have this vibrational states within each electronic state and within each vibrational state now you have the set of rotational states yeah and uh, uh, if you think about it a little bit carefully there is a wealth of information in each of those states and that information if we can tap into then we have A, a significantly a large number of applications that that we can head to okay let's look at the uh, f- the the first one let's say for example um the population okay if you take a bunch of molecules and look at the population distribution depending on your ambient temperature there will be a population distribution let's say this this is in the rotational states there will be population distribution in the rotational states as well as there can be population distribution in the vibrational states and if you go to very very high temperatures like thousands of kelvin maybe there is a population distribution amongst the electronic states yeah so uh, this population distribution is uh, defined by the maxwell boltzmann distribution right so uh, which is dependent on the temperature so that means that if i can measure what is the population in each of those states that can give me the temperature the ambient temperature wherever we are yeah and that's the that's a huge uh, application that anybody would want to because that means that if i go to a different temperature let's say the population will shift more towards the higher rotational levels or will go more towards the higher vibrational states okay so uh, all then all i have to look for is this population distribution then yeah so that in fact uh, that's how we made the temperature measurements and uh, um this is this has been extremely useful for any of the gas phase diagnostics so the simplest gas phase diagnostic would be the absorption spectroscopy and then you can look for the fluorescence spectroscopy and more complex ones but much more accurate measurements would be nonlinear processes like coherent anti stoic raman scattering where what you do is you go with a, a pump and then a, a, a stokes beam that is two photon resonant between two two of those uh, rotational vibrational states ro- we call rho vibrational states and you go with a third probe beam to to probe this um coherence that c- it creates this two pulse would create between this rho vibrational states to get the uh, car signal from there and uh, and uh, it is amazing in fact f- uh, 
um if you have ever seen a coherent antihistogram and scattering uh, signal in lab even in the gas what we see is you send in this three beams into your interaction volume and it, the fourth beam miraculously appears and even after so many years i feel like okay physically i understand physics from physics perspective i understand but it's so amazing that it happens nonlinear nonlinear physics works here and uh, oh, uh, so for that i mean let's understand why you get there in a in a minute over here so as i said pump stoke probe and then you get the car signal and this is a typical lab experiment that you do you go with uh, three beams in three particular directions pump stoke and probe and then the car signal will come out in in one particular way and why this happens is because it satisfies so called um it it satisfies the momentum conservation condition so for example if i expand the molecular polarization uh, into into all these different orders four way mixing is the, is the um the uh, four uh, i mean basically the third order susceptibility susceptibility um and that susceptibility if i if i work it out then uh, the dependence over here in the exponential you can see this this first part gives me the energy conservation so in fact w cars would be sum of these two minus this would give me the frequency of this car signal and um the uh, k is the the propagation vectors uh, if i add this way then that will tell me where the car signal will come 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 in from the from uh, the sample and that is amazing because we don't have to look for signal typically for most of the experiments you have to be looking for signal right this is as if like a laser like signal that comes out of it and that that coherent laser like signal it's a non invasive specially temporary resolved excellent spectral selectivity because it has to satisfy all this resonant condition that then only you will get the signal and low signal absorption because there is no real absorption these are all virtual states over there so and uh, also lower non resonant background and there are uh, we can get rid of collisions as we go to short pulses i mean get rid of collision means like we can avoid collisions before collision happens we can get our signal and uh, the data data acquisition rates are now kilohertz to 10 kilohertz uh, with this femtosecond lasers and we can measure make the major species measurements also we can now start to uh, we have started doing the minor species measurements with it and this is a review article where uh, we have reviewed we reviewed until 2009 but i have another review article where we reviewed the uh, what we have afterwards so for for combustion processes if you if any one of you are interested uh, it is a very powerful technique but because nitrogen is abundant in air right so in combustion process also you will have nit nitrogen there and the nitrogen picks up the environment's uh, temperature and uh, pressure conditions in its population distribution so if i can look for the population distribution the population distribution will come from my car signal because whatever the population distribution will be based on that i will get my car signal uh, the the signal will change right from there i can extract the temperature uh, uh in in let's say combustion processes and even in the high pressure conditions okay so this is a typical nanosecond um uh, cars the signal that you get from uh from a uh, flame in laboratory flame at different temperatures as i was telling you like look at 800k your lower row vibration levels are excited the black ones and you go to higher temperatures your higher uh, row vibrational states would start exciting and even the higher vibrational states the uh, would would start to show up over there yeah so um uh, the the only problem is that you cannot really get a single shot if even if you can get there is a lot of uh, fluctuation in those uh, signals um now if i look at for example rotational cars Uh, there is a high shot to sh uh, uh, high um shot to shot signal fluctuation in nanosecond cars for example like you can see here but with the femtosecond cars your signal is very very stable yeah and that's what uh, uh, is is um, um uh, that's why the femtosecond cars is so uh, helpful over here 
okay um okay now uh, let's compare the nanosecond cars versus femtosecond uh, well nanosecond pulse versus femtosecond pulse how do they compare so in terms of the uh, time if i see uh, a 10 nanosecond pulse uh, versus 100 femtosecond pulse it's really short this is much longer compared to any of those uh, molecular time scales that i was talking about but if you see in the frequency domain uh, nanosecond is very good spectrally uh, much more pure compared to what you get in the femtosecond femtosecond is really really wide lot of different frequencies over there so the skepticism at that time is well you are going to excite all these different transitions how will you ever figure it out like uh, any information out of it but think from the positive side of it so let's say with a, uh, for a raman excitation i can i can take a, a pump at certain frequency then stokes beam uh, let's say a, a broadband stokes beam and nanosecond broadband stokes beams are terrible uh, for f uh, basically a dye laser is used for the stokes beam to get single shot data but because of the fluctuations in the in the dye laser that's why the signal fluctuation is so high in nanosecond but look at femtosecond part femtosecond you have so much bandwidth over there that a combination of like different frequencies they all can uh, suit the same um, raman transitions uh, right and and that's why you can get a very strong signal out of it and uh, um, uh, the, the, in fact because of that strong coherence it can create um the signal that you see you can see in your naked eye in fact it's uh, as i said i'm always amazed that it works it works really well okay so uh, i have just listed a few of them maybe you have read it i mean this is the review article where we have discussed in length about all these uh, features of the femtosecond um uh, advantages um now where are we in terms of uh, our fundamental physics then okay um uh, the coherence that i was talking about is the same coherence that we talk in uh, the classical optics it is the same coherence that we talk in quantum optics creating quantum coherence in in uh, atomic systems and when we talk about the ultra fast where is the where is that coherence um well this is this is uh, like for particles uh massy particles mass uh, particles with masses you are not going to get any um interference uh, it's a cool video so i always put it there but um primarily what i want to show is uh, the young's interference with the double slit uh, that that you see is a special interference over there in the space the interference is in the space right because of the two beams that goes out there and then they interfere with each other and that's what you see on the screen there now in in the in the case the molecular uh, raman coherence that i'm talking about it is a temporal interference or a quantum coherence in time okay so in time when 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 i create uh, uh, when i have this combination of these two uh, lasers there omega 1 and omega 2 what happens is it creates this coherence over there in time and i take that coherence i mean i beat that coherence with another probe beam and that gives me the car signal yeah so this coherence is really really important and as long as we can create a large coherence we have a very strong signal over there yeah um for uh, for femtosecond the biggest advantage is that uh, the since you're packing this energy in a short time the intensities are very high and uh, for any nonlinear interaction uh, you will know that if the uh, you need to have very high intensities for any of the interactions over there right so um okay so now let's let's get to let's get to some of those uh, um features of this uh, uh, this temporal coherence that you create and how it it can manifest in the in the signals um we did a, a kind of a detailed study in terms of like it's a marriage of what we learned from quantum optics um maybe some of you might have heard about this coherent population trapping right 
so if you if you take two lasers and then uh, they are on resonance there then in principle you can trap the population amongst two of those states and uh, that is called um, you can create a so called dark state uh, from where normally population would not uh, uh, decay or it stays much longer and uh, we thought maybe we can explore that because every time we are going with a femtosecond beam um, we have to always remember that we are exciting a bunch of rotational levels there and uh, then of course uh, we are coupling to row, row vibrational states of ground vibrational state and this one and if if that is the case are we creating any trap state there and if we do then how can we um, how can we um, leverage that trapping uh, uh, coherent population trapping there so let's say uh, those uh, let's consider two of those uh, rotational states as b1 and b2 and couple it with two two lasers so typically in quantum optics this is what we will do two lasers that will give you the coherence between these two and and because of that now you'll have a trapping there and uh, because of the trapping you have a bright state that couples to the field but there is a dark state whatever population gets to a dark state you cannot take out from there this is a eigen state of this coupled system yeah same way over here now when you do it you do get a dark state as a combination of this two states over there yeah uh, there is a bright state and there then there are two two of these dark states and we can even calculate um, what are the um, uh, what are the dark state populations and uh, depending on the timing of those pulses uh, we can uh, we can control the dark states and that means that we can control the populations in those dark states and uh, uh, not dark states also populations i mean every time we are talking about dark state dark state is nothing but uh, a linear combination state of uh, this um, uh, original rotational state so that means that in principle i can take population from one state to the another state and let it stay there okay well for the diagnostic or for the application that i was talking about it may not have direct advantage but think about this uh, population control mechanism so with with a femtosecond pulse if i can control the population that is huge for um or uh, for, for something like uh, quantum information and all like if i can take the population and i can tell for sure that i can transfer the population to from one point to one state to the other state i can say that this is my qubit switch i mean i can a, a switch a quantum bit from one state to the other state and so on so we are yet to explore that but we are going in that direction for for this part of it um well this is a small distraction let me get back to the spectroscopy again with the femtosecond laser spectroscopy uh i mean the signal that we get uh, uh for different temperatures for example and different equivalence ratio this is fuel to air ratio Uh, if you look at uh, the signal and then compare that um, the accuracy and precision are really really high at uh, something like 1500 degree uh, kelvin your uh, accuracy and precision are 40 50 uh, plus minus 40 and 50k that is really really uh, like within 2% error right so um, uh, that's why people have already started looking this is 2008 paper people have already started looking at using this and some of the um, advantages that i am not going to list but for those who work in plasma for example there are temperatures uh, plasmas like uh, when it is not in equilibrium there are all this different temperatures uh, over there one is uh, your um, uh, the translational temperature then there are this rotational temperature vibrational temperature they are all going to be different okay because your environment it doesn't have time to kind of uh, equilibrate with the environment so each of these temperatures are going to be different and uh, in principle i can use this uh, femtosecond spectroscopy to measure all of them simultaneously yeah so people have done lots of this experiment different experiments i'm not going to bring them here but i'm i i would try to like uh, bring some of the physics here why i am getting these different signals is like at different temperatures let's say at a lower temperature i had like few of those rotor row vibrational states that that were interacting with the system and then uh, you excite them and then they will all 
oscillate at different frequencies, slightly different frequencies, and because of that, you will get a decay in the signal. Yeah, this is um, this is just from their uh, the the different oscillators oscillating at different frequencies. Um, if I consider all these row vibrational row vibrational states as different oscillators, yeah, and then if I increase the temperature, I am basically adding more oscillators to it. And because of because of that, what will happen is now uh, with a, with more oscillators. Now, when I look at the signal, the signal is going to be uh, decaying much faster because they uh, this with more oscillators they are oscillating at different frequencies the total signal is going to go faster and from there in principle I can make the measurement of the temperature yeah so uh, if I want to understand that from the very simple perspective of uh, let's say simple pendulum so you start all of them in uh, in one time but then let them go these are all slightly different masses and uh, when they oscillate you see that it started all in the same time but then they are now oscillating and then the kind of deface from each other, right? But uh, the deface that doesn't mean that uh, it's done forever. What will happen is that at later time, I just speed it up. At a later time, you will start to see that they are again becoming coherent, right? This is like a, a revival of uh, uh, the the wave function, total wave function uh, in in a molecular system. You can say. And and this is this is what is in play when when we are talking about uh, this um, this uh, uh, ultra fast uh, coupling and giving us the signal there, yeah. And uh, we have uh, uh, we have a good control on understanding that part. But again, there were people th who were skeptical about. Well, the intensities are so high with femtosecond. Then maybe that would mean that you are probably just saturating everything, saturating all the transitions there, and the signal that you are getting. Even there are people like the big people in, uh, in this community, um, uh, particularly laser diagnostic community. They uh, they kept hammering in each conference, saying that hey, you don't know even what signal that you are looking at, and uh, they would say that probably everything that you are seeing is a saturated signal. So uh, so. Uh, we went into like in a detail uh, calculations of uh, looking at the saturation in the Raman transitions and uh, what we found is that um, the uh, yes you can saturate but the saturation uh, thresholds are higher as you go to shorter and shorter pulses yeah and uh, for example for um, about um, 100 frame per second pulse the peak power uh, a, a peak intensity, sorry, it, it should be intensity, is on the order of 21 to 22 watt per meter square, and that's a huge intensity. What happens is that at, at those kind of intensities, you have this filamentation and intensity clamping, all those things will take over, right? Uh, but, you know, we don't even get to that level. We, we stay somewhere around, around here which means that we are never saturating our signal uh, and if you compare that with a nanosecond regime, in fact, uh, this is uh, uh, in the nanosecond regime, the mechanism is completely different for saturation than the femtosecond regime, I, as I talked a little bit earlier, yeah? So I won't get into the details again, but uh, um, just to compare 20 nanosecond pump, uh, the saturation and stock shift would happen somewhere around 10 or 14 watt per meter square. Uh, so where this two photon Rabi coupling has to be uh, stronger than or, to, or larger than the uh, um, decay um, rate. And uh, at uh, 100 frame per second pump, the molecular response um, can be determined from this uh, two photon pulse area and uh, the two, as long as two photon pulse area is more than pi it will saturate so if you are less than pi then you are safe and uh, we determined that somewhere around 20 or 21 22 watt per meter square you will saturate and uh, that has in fact this has helped uh, there are a bunch of paper that came out after this where th now they they can do their femtosecond experiments without worrying about saturation because of uh, uh, the limits that that we could determine from the theoretical calculation over there 
and um, similarly uh, if you go to a slightly a different variant of this uh, cars that i was talking about let's say your probe is now resonant to one of this transition i mean this is like two electronic states so this is electronic resonant transition so re this is uh, what we i mean uh, if we do ele electronic resonant then any resonance enhances your coupling and because of that stronger coupling now your signal strength can be higher and it was proposed as one of the uh, uh, one of the possible way to get to um, get to uh, like minor species in this case this was nitric oxide and uh, uh, this was the signal that was observed and um, they could go to very low um, density over there and um, um, uh, the, the, of course these are different partners uh, collisional partners they could go to low, very low densities and then uh, we did this calculation uh, with uh, uh, with the same combinations and i we found that uh, okay one thing they were seeing that at certain certain intensity the signal would would not increase anymore and they were not sure if if that is the best signal or they could get better signal or there is some instrument uh, has some limits or something so uh, we did a theoretical calculation and we found out that uh, they are at that point are close to the saturation yeah and uh, that means that again the if i want an optimal signal optimal interaction to get the optimal signal we need to understand where the saturation is and that tells us with confidence that this is the best signal that we can get right and similarly we can do for the ultra fast uh, uh, cars for the same thing same configuration and what we found is that the um, for the long pulse regime uh, like below 1 picosecond um, your saturation intensity is constant and uh, that is understandable because the, over there like like i said in the beginning uh for the nanosecond or for the short pulse the uh, or sorry nanosecond or cw uh, your saturation uh, intensity is defined by your rabi oscillation being rabi rabi period being shorter than your decay period in this case uh, uh, once once that is the case then this is what will happen but then once you go pick one picosecond or shorter pulses then that condition is not valid anymore you can see that uh, for different pulse durations now you have different uh, saturation intensities and uh, we did this calculation for for this um, uh, resonantly enhanced uh, cars and we could get a condition and in fact using this condition uh, uh, the my colleagues uh, in that group they they went to do uh, this experiment um, um and they knew what what is the optimal intensity and they did this measurement for minor species using the femtosecond lasers with ex a very high um uh, signal to noise ratio for for temperature and um species concentration measurements um so uh so i think I think I'm uh, I'm going to just stop here probably I I wanted to go a little bit further but then I will just leave it here uh, so let me skip to my uh, last slide and then uh, uh, yeah and and uh, I just wanted to uh, summarize um, what we talked about is high speed diagnostics high pressure measurement and some fiber based sensors I didn't get into details but you can make the fiber based uh, sensing in harsh environments where you cannot bring your lasers uh, extremely sensitive lasers to to near your um, um near this harsh environment so you just use fibers there and then there are certain applications i didn't talk about but um, you know using this uh, uh, ultra short pulse interactions with this high intensities they they uh, they generate uh, this um, plasmas with very high uh, i mean relativistic uh, speed electrons and uh, protons uh, um, uh, even x rays and the hope is we can get to neutrons and that that research is going on uh, even now then there are short pulse terahertz generations uh, uh, using uh, this uh, femtosecond laser heating on superconductors for example 
so uh, and and that can give us also temporal behavior of the superconductors we, we can understand from there and there are this auto second signs that can come uh, as i was alluding to in one of the big uh, beginning um, in the in the one of the first slides there so there are whole lot of interesting uh, ultra fast phenomena uh, in terms of science and applications that are still waiting to be explored so uh, with that note i would say thanks for your attention and i will be happy to answer if you get, if you have any question Thank you, Anil, uh, for that talk. My pleasure. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, I would uh, like to ask a small question from my side. Yeah, please. Uh, it's uh, basically based on uh, the cast which you have mentioned. So mm -hmm. you, you were mentioning about uh, some uh, limit when you uh, look at the area under the curve. That mm -hmm. is something more than pi the value. Mm -hmm. It is going to be saturation. Yeah. Can you just uh, tell me more about that? Absolutely. Uh, okay, let me go back to that slide and okay. So, um, so basically, any uh, interaction of um, electromagnetic field with atom. Uh, if I want to see in CW regime, all I do is the dipole interaction, right? D dot E interaction. And D dot E, if you understand in terms of the radio frequency, that E is the radio frequency. D dot E over H bar is the radio frequency. So that interaction is something in the CW regime, it's straightforward and uh, we have done all these calculations in the past. But once it gets to the pulse, how do I define what is the what is my strength of interaction? How do I define um, how much um, uh, the, this uh, radio frequency is playing the role there? So what we do is then we integrate that interaction that whatever that so in time your intensity is changing. Unlike in CW uh, CW laser, your intensity E square is flat, right? So in 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 this case, your intensity is changing. So what we do is we integrate over the, the, the whole pulse and as if I am looking at the integrated interaction uh, area, that is the pulse area that I was talking about. So the pulse area is telling me how strongly I'm interacting and taking uh, uh, the, the atomic or molecular state from one state to another state. And as long, I mean, in this case, I've just, I went to a Gaussian because typically all the pulses are I mean, we can assume safely they are Gaussian and using the Gaussian pulse, I calculated and I found that this is the integrated pulse area. As long as this integrated pulse, pulse area is larger than pi, uh, I would say that, oh, um, then I will have saturation. But if it is less than pi, I can say that um, the, the, uh, the interaction is not strong enough to take the population from one to the other, uh, one state to the other state. In fact, I want to even connect to another concept that uh, we knew from the quantum optics perspective, the stirrup, for, for example, right? And in stirrup, again, the combination of the pulses, as long as the pulse area is uh, larger than uh, pi by pi over two, then uh, pi over two would, uh, I think, would make the population 50-50. Pi would uh, take the population, flip the population to excited state, and then uh, three pi over uh, two would bring, I mean, will make 50-50 again, and uh, two pi would bring it down. So now using that concept now to specifically to this case, and we are saying is that uh, uh, if the pulse area is uh, more than pi, then we'll say that there is, int there is uh, saturation. In fact, this paper that I have, uh, we have, I have done this full, I mean, this whole uh, thing, that concept that I'm talking about is there in this paper now. So. Um, I hope uh, yes, yes. there is a, another question in the chat box. I'll just yeah. read it to you. Yeah. I saw yeah. Zepto second uh, written in the first slide. How mm -hmm. can it be generated? Ah, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, it, that's what I wanted to hear from, uh, I guess, uh, students or anybody that wants to know. Well, uh, Zepto second is the time scale that comes from the 
nuclear interactions okay so um what we have talked about is molecular atomic molecular interactions even to the electronic interactions or electronic motions that we talked about but if you look at uh, the nuclear motions they happen in in jepto second time scale so if we can tap into the nuclear interactions uh using optics <laughs> by some means of course uh, as you can imagine this is like um thousandth of a millionth of a millionth of a second or uh, millionth of a billionth of a second which is um, which is a uh, thousandth of a billionth of a billionth of a second which is really short we don't have any mechanism or in, we don't have any direct way of uh, uh, looking at or um, interacting with it right now but you know we never know i mean decades before two two decades before or three decades before we didn't know that we can look at uh, uh femtosecond a decade before or two decade before we didn't know about attosecond maybe in f- in another decade or so we will have interactions at the jeptosecond level uh, are we then talking about uh, uh, gamma resorts yes exactly and uh, the, the, so for for any of those uh, nuclear interactions we have to have gamma ray and a coherent gamma ray the challenge with gamma ray is getting to a coherent gamma ray spectrally pure gamma ray so since we don't have it right now that's why that's why we cannot have this access there are some people in fact in in germany they have looked at uh, gamma ray spectroscopy uh, uh, equivalent quantum optics equivalent in gamma ray um, but uh, not to um, i mean I, at this time i am i'm not too optimistic about those kind of particular uh, uh, results but i'm hoping that we will get more into more more and more into this gamma ray coherent gamma rays and uh, then we'll have this ability or we'll have the access to this uh, um jeptos second regime and uh, has there been any experiments done with atto second oh yeah atto second there are a bunch of experiments done i mean in fact this is this paper is one of the uh first experiments and um there are uh multiple groups now in in uh, the world that are working on atto second so i would say uh in florida we have this uh, um uh, university of central florida that's UCF. where ucf that has a very uh, strong group uh, on atto second i think uh, professor jang he is uh, leading that uh, atto second um, uh, group there then uh, in uh, in canada uh, we have uh, paul corkum uh, he is a theoretician but then he also has experimental labs that are looking at the atto second regime and there is another group in germany uh, max planck institute okay now it will be hard for me to remember the name okay i i can tell you later but um, uh, oh, so they they those groups are really looking for an um, nobel prize maybe future nobel prize <laughs> so at this time the challenge is to get isolated atto second pulses right now you can get atto second pulse but uh, uh, they are still not very isolated i mean you have to be filtering out a lot and and in fact one of my postdoc that joined me recently he uh, and uh, he worked in ohio state university um they also worked in, uh, in atto second um regime but uh, again uh, what i hear from him is there is still a challenge to get to that uh, isolated atto second pulse so um so yeah there are there are a lot of this different groups that are looking at this uh, atto second dynamics and uh, people have even looked at uh, the electronic dynamics in uh, ionization processes uh, like like this one that that i showed and uh, and see uh, the electronic dynamics there okay i don't find any more questions in the q and a uh, i i uh, i have uh, 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 yeah, thank you anil uh, i hand over to dr pravin to wind up the session sure I think Rinju sir has a question. Oh, yes, yes. I think I think I have. Yeah, um, please, please. Um, Anil, I, um, it was um, you have presented the subject uh, so nicely that uh, I'm now motivated to read uh, your reviews, and uh, I'm quite new to cars. Um, but um, 
what type of lasers that you uh, what is the laser that you are using is it like a tunable diode laser i suppose uh, and um so i covered a, a whole range from nanosecond to femtosecond um so all the ultra fast uh, dynamics and all that i was talking about is using femtosecond lasers and femtosecond lasers are typically uh, let's say uh, your like uh, coherent laser uh, coherent astral laser or spectral physics as femtosecond lasers so those are um, region amplifiers regenerative amplifiers are used to uh, generate uh, 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 femtosecond pulse i mean basically amplify this femtosecond pulses that you can uh, generate from a femtosecond oscillator yeah, yeah. Um, and similarly you, then then there is a, there is another set of uh, experiment that people do in fact uh, even even the group uh, that i worked with in the past they have picosecond lasers and uh, um, again um, these are all tie sapphire based lasers of course uh, with the picosecond lasers uh, uh, with picosecond laser amplifiers they can look at uh, the time scales that falls on in a very um, sweet spot somewhere in around uh, the molecular rotation time scale so the, those are being used for uh, for direct measurement of decays and dephasing etc yeah and then there are these nanoseconds of course nanoseconds are uh, somewhere around 10 nanosecond uh, lasers i mean i frankly i didn't present anything uh, on here with the diode lasers the diode lasers typically give you the cw um uh, but, tunable, okay, yeah. yeah yeah tunable diode laser. Uh, and because uh, 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 what i was thinking is since mm -hmm. uh, most of your uh, measurements are spectrally resolved that means yeah. uh, you use uh, high resolution spectrometers to do that or... yeah absolutely yeah we do use high resolution uh, spectrometers and uh, um, for the femtosecond regime Mm, though uh, high, resolution, high resolution spectroscopy is not as great unless uh, we get to that one last slide that I showed the application of this uh, um, uh, this uh, resonantly enhanced signal uh, this one this is where one in principle one can get to the spectra's uh, spectral side of um, the time resolved signal I mean, uh, for the femtosecond pulses, the challenge is to get a high resolution uh, spectra out of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so if if we did anything, say for example, I also presented one here, and uh, this is this is, we are looking at the Raman shift. You can see the lines are not uh, like as well resolved as nanosecond, but the stability is very high. And we can use that stability part for uh, the measurements that we are talking about. And also, towards the end of your talk, you uh, mm -hmm. showed laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. Just one slide. And can you <laughs> use uh, this CARS technique to measure uh, temperatures in? Um, I, absolutely, in uh, we can make the measurement. But as you can understand, CAR setup needs. Uh, much more involved setup, right? So yeah. having a lips and cars, that is the dream setup. I would love to have that kind of laboratory. <laughs> so, so yes, yeah, in principle, you can you can shoot these three lasers there and you can get the car signal. The car signal will have all the information. Yeah, but, but if you have a femtosecond system, okay, you, yeah. you will, uh, then you can split the beam, make mm -hmm. uh, one of the beams to uh, do the lips and then... Uh, uh, right, two or right. three beams for the other one. Right, right. That's so, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, you're absolutely right, Riju. I mean, uh, it it can be done, but typically we keep these two separate. I mean, Lips Lab is separate and uh, uh, yeah. Lips Lab is separate. And if yeah. we have to do, in fact, we are, um, we are, we have moved uh, towards that direction. I would say. Uh, recently, uh, one of my student did the measurement like uh, uh, Raman based measurement from so uh, of course we didn't go to femtosecond in that case, we went with a nanosecond laser 
and we would create the uh, lips there but then we will make a raman measurement uh, raman emission measurement to talk about um, the concentration of different species in there yeah. okay uh, have you published it there uh, that is uh, in uh, in review right now ah uh, okay 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 yeah okay. It, that, I, I... It, i think in lithium we have done it in lithium but solid state sample we have we have done that measurement and we are going along that direction like right now lips is all about emission spectroscopy whatever emission that comes out but then if i want to uh, do the diagnostic for it measure the temperature measure the concentrations this is what we need to do we have to we have to introduce a diagnostic mechanism uh, one simplest one could be pump probe mechanism the uh, then then we we could look at uh, the evolution with the pump probe uh, the 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 more uh, complex ones are the cars one cars is is uh, like it's a pretty involved process i mean uh, particularly femtosecond cars you are talking about bringing this three beams yeah at a femtosecond time scale within uh, within the range of femtosecond time scale means like you are talking about few millimeters or no sorry few Maybe 30 centimeters. microns 30 microns is 30 under micron, right yeah, yeah. so within 30 micron you have to have this three pulses coming in and hitting in the same area and that's how you can get the signal yeah. so It's that's what the is. yeah so you are talking about a millionth of a billionth of a second level control within that 30 microsecond right <laughs> so 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 that's where the challenge is so uh, yeah i mean with the technological developments i won't wonder that uh, i won't be surprised that this can this is done in next 5 years or so but uh, right now we are not there but we are moving towards that direction for okay. sure we we might probably get uh, i think we have funding for an astra type of laser Okay. Astra type, that's uh, right. Uh, yeah. For the next year, yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I'll lo- I'll really look forward to if you are getting into those those kind of research. I look forward to your work. And and I didn't show, but uh, we did we did look at femtosecond um, breakdown, and uh, we have a huge advantage. Maybe if you can share email with me at some point, I can send you these papers <laughs> that that we have. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, that will be great. I I'll be in touch. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I think uh, we can officially wind up the session. So, thank you, Anil Sir. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening and to be a part of our Silver Jubilee celebrations. It was a wonderful uh, and energetic lecture. And uh, thank you again for sharing some time, uh, some valuable time with us. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you soon uh, in 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 Kochi. Okay, and uh, let me take this opportunity to talk uh, to thank the participants as well, and we will see you back very soon with the tenth lecture of our series. And have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, and congratulations to all of you for this wonderful series here. And thank you, Anil. Bye. And thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Riju, for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Praveen. Thank you, Professor Gopinath, and thank you, Riju. Bye bye.